Now, I'm going to start with this. Hope it works. Hey everybody, I'm Steve Jones, N6SJ. Welcome to CW Skills for DXing. My first CW was here in Sputnik in 1957. Got my license in 1961. I've been chasing DX on CW ever since. My goal today is to get you to use CW to chase DX if you don't already. Where is the, is that the, okay. Um, Okay, where are my, my notes here? Oh dear, I can't see my notes, help. Frank went to the fam. Oh, <laughs> well, that won't do me much. Let's see if I can. Uh, okay, well, I'm just, I'm gonna talk about four main topics tonight. Uh, general operating hints for HF, which apply to CW, of course. Then I'm going to tell you why you ought to think about using CW. And if you decide you do, how to optimize your CW station and your CW skills. And then how to make your calls more competitive on CW. So in general, you should spend most of your time listening, not calling. Get to know your local propagation trends so you know when and where to listen. For instance, there's no point tuning around 160 meters at noon in the middle of August. <laughs> now, spotting websites are really useful to reveal what paths are open to various parts of the world. So the first thing you need to do is uh, find out what the DX call is. Uh, there are so, I, I hear so many people calling in a pileup who are obviously not copying. They're actually calling while the DX is still sending. So you got to listen and don't just spotting nets. Uh, say sometimes I think maybe we need to see people muted on Zoom. Yeah, if you're on Zoom, could you please mute? What's that? People that aren't muted. Right, next time I have the laptop, I'll leave it on my phone. Is it this? Hang on. Is that better? Yes. Okay, it was me. Sorry. Uh -huh. no, hold on. Uh, I need help here. I can't read my my notes. the the Zoom The Zoom window is blocking my notes. You see this? Yeah. See. What do I do? I don't need to see that. There you go. Uh, so your notes are down here. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, so the main thing about listening is make sure you actually hear and copy the DX station's call sign. Now, uh, another part of listening is figure out what the DX is trying to tell you. Uh, well, no, I'm on the wrong slide. Are they listening on their own transmit frequency? You, you need to figure out where they're listening. Are they listening on their own transmit frequency, on another fixed frequency, or maybe they're listening over a range of frequencies? So as far as propagation goes, uh, the DX is trying to tell you how to complete a QSO. If you hear them send UP2, it means they're expecting you to call them two kilohertz above the transmit frequency. If they send now only EU, that means now only Europe. Don't call if you're not in Europe. And if you hear someone send something like K6Y question mark, that means they got a partial call and they're an only call if you are John Eisenberg and that's your partial call. <laughs> if, if it's not your partial call, 
then, oh boy, sorry folks, I'm having trouble with this machine. Uh, how do I do this? Uh, most, most DX operators, if they send something like that, they will fight to complete that partial call. Mm -hmm. And if you try to call at the same time, all you're gonna do is delay your own chance of getting in a log. So in general, uh, the propagation trends from the West Coast are 20 meters is good around local sunset in the spring and the fall. In the winter time, 30 and 40 meters is good around local sunrise. And in the summertime, 20 meters is great to Oceania and the Pacific after dark. Um, if all else fails, if, if you cannot have a rotatable beam, beam north. Now this, this map shows, uh, this is centered on San Francisco, and you'll see that most of the population centers in the world are to the north of us. Yeah, there's population in the Pacific and South America, but uh, if you have a fixed beam north, my very first DX antenna was a ZL special for 20 meters strung between uh, my parents' upstairs window and a tree in the backyard. And on that fixed antenna, I worked over 200 countries as a teenager, starting in Asia, through uh, the Middle East, through Europe, and Africa. Uh, that's a great direction to point if you, if you don't have a rotatable antenna. Spotting websites are really useful. They tell you who is hearing who else in the world, and that can help you anticipate path openings. So for instance, if you hear all your buddies on the West Coast spotting South America, uh, you know, what about 150 degrees or so? No, maybe about 120 degrees. Uh, in the late afternoon on 20 meters in February, you just might be ready to have a long path opening to India. So why would you want to work CW? I talked about general HF operating hints, which apply to CW. Why would you want to operate CW? So first of all, I'll talk about what it is. Let's see, I'm on the, I need the next slide. What it is, uh, how it can give you more success on marginal paths, how it can give you a competitive edge when you're in a pileup, and how overall it improves your DX odds just being competent on CW. And finally, why it's fun. So CW is the interruption of a continuous wave. That's where the C and the W comes from. This is the original digital modulation. The information is contained in the length of the characters and the spaces in between them. It's very narrow bandwidth, but it does have sidebands. And these are harmonics of the keying waveform. Uh, if, if you have a very fast and uh, rise time and fall time on your CW uh, waveform, you'll generate clicks. That's not a good thing. That's too sharp. If you have a very soft, slow rise time and decay time, then it sounds mushy. So you want your CW waveform to be just right to be very clear at the other end, crisp and clean. So uh, you, you can generally figure on having uh, more success on marginal paths. Uh, right now we're approaching a solar maximum in cycle 25. In fact, I heard recently that NOAA is predicting we might hit the peak later this year, the end of this year. Uh, it's a lot sooner than I expected. But as the sun spots taper off over the next few years or in the winter months, when the Northern latitudes get lower uh, ionization, you'll be glad to have CW as an alternate DX mode. It'll give you about an 8 dB improvement uh, over single sideband. Let's see, I'm, on the, I'm confused here. I've got two different slides showing. Okay. Uh, okay. One thing I wanted to mention here, I didn't, I didn't make my comment about FT8. He did at the bottom. Yeah, well, 
<laughs> FT8 is a great mode. And uh, let's see if I can get this. It gives you even more system gain than CW. I'm seeing, they're seeing this and I'm seeing this. And this is telling you what the next slide will be. No, that's the next slide. Okay, that's why I'm getting confused. Okay. okay. All right. But FT8 requires a PC. And basically, it's a PC talking to a PC. There's really no uh, uh, personal conversational communication using your own ears and your own brain talking to the other operator. Um, let's see, how do I do this? Okay. I have completed QSO slightly below the noise level on CW, but never on sideband. So if the solar flux is low and you're stuck on 40 meters with a low dipole, you're much more likely to complete a DX contact on CW than on sideband. Okay, so CW can provide unique competitive advantages. Uh, it can make your CW signal stand out from the other callers, either with the sound of your signal, the, the, the tone of it, or the timing of your calls. It improves your DX odds. You know, these days, if you want to chase DX, you really need to be competent on CW. In the past, many DX expeditions used to use only single sideband. It's a high QSO rate. Many of these operations had no great CW operators. But in 1997, VK0IR, Heard Island, it really changed all that and rekindled interest in CW for the expeditions. They made more than 80,000 contacts, mostly on CW from Heard Island. Today, most the expeditions do include CW. So if you're not, uh, if you ignore CW, you're missing a lot of opportunities. So, some DX operators use only CW. When I worked YI9KT, he was operating only CW. <clears throat> and 30 meters, which is a great band during winter months or at a solar minimum, has no allocations for single sideband at all. It's only digital or CW. So if you're not on CW, you're missing a lot of DX opportunities. And last but not least, it's really learning a new skill, kind of like learning a new musical instrument. And it really is another language. High-speed CW operators can chat at 50 to 60 words a minute in plain language English. You add in the CW abbreviations they use, and they could be conversing around 100 words per minute, not much slower than I'm talking to you. And, okay. and who's the, the CFO net? Oh, the chicken fat operators. The chicken yeah, fat operators. Fat. That's the kind of stuff they do. They were a bunch of them. Yeah, <laughs> real fast. Okay. So now, if you if I convince you, you should use CW. Now, how are you going to op optimize your station and your skills to, to do well on CW? Okay. So, first of all, Let's operate, uh, optimize your station. First of all, you need an adequate signal at the DX station's receiver. Um, there's an old saying, you can't work them if you can't hear them. Well, the absolute reverse is true. You can't work them if they can't hear you. And there's three key factors. Uh, you gotta have adequate signal, the power at the DX receiver input. You got to have you got to be inside the DX receiver's passband, and you got to send the proper CW message content. Well, let's see how we do that. Your adequate signal power at the DX station depends on, in part, your transmitter output power, your transmission line losses, and your antenna gain. Now, I say in part because you don't control the DX station's antenna gain transmission line losses or receiver sensitivity. If those are poor, the X might not hear you anyway. But you got to do what you can, what you can control at your end to optimize your station. And then you're at the mercy of mother nature to give you propagation to the other end. So to make sure your signal, okay, so let's say you have enough power 
at the receiver input terminals at the DX station. Next thing you gotta be sure is that you have your signal inside the DX receiver's passband. There's two key questions. Where is the DX listening and where are you transmitting? And if the answer to those two questions isn't identical, there's gonna be no contact. Typical CW receiver might have an audio passband of say 400 to 900 Hertz. If your signal isn't within that range, the DX will not hear you. Let's see now, did I, did I miss a, uh, no, I didn't miss that, okay. <laughs> so, <clears throat> first of all, figure out where is the DX listening? Are they on simplex? That means they're on their, they're listening on their own transmit frequency. Are they split but fixed? This is like rare DX that wants to keep the pileup off of their transmit frequency. And they might say, I'm listening up two or up five. And then there's a typical de expedition split where they, they just say up and they're listening to a band of frequencies. If there's simplex, you simply zero beat the DX signal and call. Typically, this is uh, when they're calling CQ and they're just expecting someone to answer on them, their own frequency. Split fix, where they say up to, means I'm listening two kilohertz higher than my transmit frequency. Set your transmitter two kilohertz higher and uh, call the DX. Uh, where's my... Oh. Okay, now split moving is typical of a DX position, the expedition, but DX listens over a band of frequencies, maybe two to 10 kilohertz above the transmit frequency, maybe even farther. I've heard them spread out 100 kilohertz and crazy, crazy expeditions. Uh, it spreads out the heavy QRM from hundreds of callers. But the key here is to learn the pattern of the DX operator. Usually it'll turn a little higher after each QSO. Sometimes they tune lower. I've heard that, but it's very rare. Usually it's a little higher. And you need to figure out what the increment is. Are they tuning up maybe 500 hertz for the next call or one kilohertz, two kilohertz? Sometimes they'll jump five, 10 kilohertz, <laughs> but you got to learn what that pattern is. And then when you hear the, the most recent call or uh, QSO being completed, you know where to call them in relationship to their last QSO. Okay, now the other part of getting your signal in the DX receiver's passband is being sure you know where you're transmitting. You need to calibrate your main frequency display. If you see a station spotted and you want to dial to that frequency and call them, you need to know you're calibrated. WWV signals are great for calibration. Make sure your CW side tone is properly set, typically around 700 Hertz. Any error will offset your transmit frequency when you call, possibly moving your signal out of their passband. And a good way to check that is with a local ham. Even better, listen to your own transmitter from uh, another local ham station. Have him or her call you from your own station and then listen to see if the tone sounds right. Is it in their passband when you're sitting at their station listening? If your transceiver offers CW upper or lower, switch in the, the local oscillator to opposite sides, the switching shouldn't change the tone of the signal. If it does, you need to be recalibrated. If your transceiver has a spotting button, learn to use it. But here I'm gonna give you an example of being in a, in a uh, sharp CW filter and simply shifting 200 Hertz to one side. That's 200 Hertz off. I'm 40, 40 dB down when I shifted up 200 Hertz. You gotta know exactly where you're transmitting. Okay. So now you know you've got enough power at the receiver input at the DX receiver. You know you're right in the passband where they're listening. You've figured all that out. Now what are you gonna send? Okay, you, first you need to generate clean, easy to copy CW. 
And then you need to send the proper exchange when the DX answers you. So clean CW, you could use a hand key. We had a club member, Art K6WIF, he's a silent key now. He reached DXCC on CW at 18 words a minute with a hand key. That was quite an accomplishment. Then there's the Viberplex bug. I call this an interesting form of 19th century Victorian technology. This is a semi-automatic mechanical key. Some bug operators are pretty good. I own one, but I've uh, I never got very good with it. The electronic key is the preferred key. It forms perfectly formed dots, dashes, and spaces that are easy to copy for the other operators. And it also, if you want to be picked up on CW skimmer by someone else, it makes it much easier for CW skimmer to decode you. Iambic keying uses a dual paddle. This requires the least amount of hand movement. And if you're just learning CW now, you should start out with iambic keying. I didn't, and I still have to slap the paddle on both sides. <laughs> Okay, here's a picture of a Viberplex bug on the left and my Kent dual paddle iambic here on the right. The Kent is what I use. My touch is kind of heavy and the Kent is, is such a heavy mass of metal that it keeps from walking across the table. It's a nice solid, solid key. So your keying speed. Many DX operators send it around 20 words a minute. My audio samples here are 20 words a minute. More than 30 words a minute is fairly rare, except in contests or high-speed nets. Most DX expeditions I hear run at about 20 to 25 words per minute. This seems to maximize the QSO rate while minimizing the number of errors and repeats. Uh, I have heard the expeditions operators screaming along at 30, 35 words a minute, but there's a lot of interruptions because people don't get their call, they miss the call, they ask for repeats. Um, so 2025 is a good solid level to try to achieve. You can do that with tapes and CDs, learning the Far Farnsworth method. That's pretty cool because uh, it basically is giving you CW characters at 18 words a minute, but with longer spacing between the letters. And then it starts out about five words per minute, but then it... Uh, reduces the space between the letters until you're up to 18 words a minute. Uh, you'll run into plateaus. Typical plateaus are like five words a minute is a real struggle was for me to first achieve. And then around 10 to 12 words a minute, you get stuck again. And then maybe 18 to 20 words a minute. But if you stay at that plateau and keep hammering away, you will break through to the next level. Follow the DX operator CW speed. You might find some DX operators seem to be operating really slow. Uh, maybe they're new at it. I remember uh, Meralda on uh, Pitcairn Island many years ago. She, she was the new operator. She was slow and you had to be really patient, but you could work her. <laughs> okay. Now, do you want to use QSK or semi-break-in? Uh, full break-in allows you to receive between the individual dits and dots. It provides instant feedback of what's going on <coughs> rather than waiting for the TR switch relay to time out. This can be really useful in contests or for DX operators, but I don't think it's that important when you're a DX or calling the pilot. And I personally don't use it. I use fast semi-break-in. I find a full break-in Kind of distracting all, all that instant change in signal levels and all. Okay, so now you've got really high quality CW now. You, you're, you've got enough signal level that is input. You, you're in the pass band. You've got really high quality CW going into his earphones. Now, what are you going to send? <laughs> so you need to fit your call to the context of the QSO. And I list, the, to me, the four typical variations. So here's like a non-rare DX station. So this is my exchange with uh, Gina, uh, UA9MA. It's near sunset on 20 meters in February. He just called CQ. 
uh, and I, I zero beat his signal and called him. And he answered me, and then this is what I sent. Um, hang on here. So I said, UA9MA from N6SJ. Roger, thanks, Gina. Thanks for the report from OMSC. Here are your RSTs 569 near San Francisco. My name is Steve. How do you copy UA9MA from N6SJ? Now, uh, I was saving time by using CW shorthand with a lot of those little abbreviations. But here we're just conversing casually. This is a non-rarity extation. Now here's the rare DX station. Yeah, it sure is. <laughs> I was waiting for John's comment. <laughs> so here's Omar, YK1AO in Damascus, Syria. And I think he lives in Los Angeles today. San Diego. San Diego, okay. Right state, okay. He's trying to work as many stations as possible at our local sunrise on the West Coast in January on 40 meters. Band's gonna be open for another 20 minutes until the sun comes fully up and then it's gonna be gone. This is not a de-expedition, he'll be there tomorrow, but there's a pilot calling. So I heard him send UP2. So I called him two kilohertz up. This is a crisp exchange, but not the quickest. YK1AO from N6SJ, I confirm receipt of your 559, thank you from N6SJ. Okay, and then he goes on to the next station, the pilot. Now, here's the quickest possible exchange. Teams on a frozen, wind-blown blown island running off generator power for only a few more days. Paul at BPA STI at South Thule Island is trying to work three QSOs or more per minute. That's no more than 20 seconds for a contact. Don't even send his call sign. That's wasting precious time. If you're in the pileup, he knows you're calling him. I found where he was listening and sent my call. He answered with N6SJ5NN. I answered with 5NNTU. That's it, done, in the log. Do not include your call sign at this point. The DX operator will think, well, maybe I copied his call wrong and he's repeating to correct me. He'll ask for repeats. It creates confusion and wastes time and it wastes their fuel and their generator. So now here's what I call uh, a rag chew. This is a continuation of my QSO with Gina UA9MA. Uh, UA9MA from N6SJ, Roger, Roger, fine business on your weather and your transmitter, da, 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 da. Here the transmitter is 100 watts and a two element quad, the weather's cool, 10 degrees centigrade and cloudy, da, 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 da. Now I have nothing more, I'll QSL via the Bureau, 73, dear Gina, dos vidanya, UA9MA from N6SJ. Now, uh, this is, this is uh, this double dash, that I'm using here is a filler to hold the frequency. And while I'm thinking about what I'm going to say next, it lets the other operator know you're still there, you're still engaged with them, but, uh, and it keeps someone else from suddenly taking over the frequency if you're stopping to think about something. Uh, one thing to watch out for is uh, I, I like to send Dosti Danya to Russian operators, or I used to. And sometimes I get a rash of Russian back in Cyrillic letters. Yeah. So I wouldn't have a clue what they're saying. Now I don't talk to many Russians anyway. <laughs> um, but never, never write you like this if a DX station is making short QSOs in a pileup. That'd be very poor form. But if the DX wants to be chatty, you should follow suit. It will very likely improve your, your chances for getting a QSL card. Again, match your message content to the context of the QSO. Okay, so now how are we gonna make your calls more competitive? You send in the right information, good clean CW, the right information with the right signal level in his pass band, but, but there's a lot of other people calling too. There's a wolf pack calling. How do you differentiate your signal from the rest of the wolf pack? 
So there's subtle variations in your CW tone or the timing of your call can really make your signal stand out from the pack. These tricks are unique to CW, much harder to do much of it on sideband, and they don't even apply to FTA. That's just a computer talking to a computer. So I'll talk about these uh, in detail here. First of all, frequency techniques. Um, you can offset your signal tone from the pack. Uh, here's a, in, my, in this case, I'm going to be calling a little lower. you could hear my call down lower. And the other callers are kind of in the middle of the passband and they're all interfering with each other. So I'm a little lower trying to stand out. Okay. Now in a, uh, I think maybe I've already talked about this, in a split moving. So this is simplex and, and split offset. In a split moving, yeah, you want to listen to the last QSO that was just ending and then drop your call in at the next increment. So in this example I put on the slide, uh, the DX is at 14025 and they're listening 14030, 31, 32, working their way every kilohertz up to 14040 and then jumping back to 030 and working up again. So you've, you've got to listen for a few minutes, hopefully not too long, and find the last QSO that the DX operator is just finishing and then go the next increment up and that's where you're gonna call. Very, very common. Yes? Quick question, sorry yeah. to interrupt. This may seem naive, but if the person is in a contest using that method, uh, he or she, are they are they actually taking the VFO and going like this or is, is it done, being done by some Computer. Oh no, they have they have two VFOs. They have the transmitter on one VFO and the receiver on another. So and they're actually taking they're the turning the knob on the that. receiver okay. and dialing up as they go along. They finish one QSO and dial up to the next okay. one. Yeah. They're not and, like hitting a button. Yes. Well, I don't know. Is that you ever hit a button? Uh, <laughs> well, you can you use an excise control? Yeah. Uh, to, to do that. Yeah. But in a contest, they're going to be simplex. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're going to be simplex in the contest, but the expedition is always listening either up or down. That's right. And for small variations, you can use XIP. If you want to move farther than you know a couple kilohertz, you should do split. That's right. So that the person that is actually doing the VFO. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're tuning. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That takes time too. And when yeah. Steven saw goes out, it's called tail ending, which is really a lost art. Um, well, this is what I'm going to talk talk about. Yeah. Right. Right now, I'm just going to get into tail ending. Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so uh, another way of uh, adjusting uh, your your signal to be more competitive is with timing techniques, and and this is sort of a version of tail ending, but I call it calling slower than other callers. I like to do this. I'm not hearing that. Is that everyone hearing this? No, it need, needs to share the sound in Zoom. Yeah, we don't hear anything. I'm half I'm half deaf, so it could be my problem. Well, I'll I'll just <laughs> this will be recorded. I'll describe yeah. what I'm doing here. Basically, yeah, sending good. slower than all the other callers, and what that does is that sets me off from them, and it also sort of uh, accidentally on purpose, it helps me tail end. When they stop calling, I'm still my up. slow signal is still in the passband. Yeah. Okay. Now let me try the next slide. To show, at least to get the last two letters of your call sign. That's right. No, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Now here's uh, an example of tail ending. Type one, I call it. Uh, you're, you're calling right at the end of a, a current QSO, just before it's over, but before anyone else calls. 
Now the DX operator might not like this and might not answer you, but the problem is, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Really good operator. Hang on. Really good operator. Let me get back to here. If he does answer tail enders, then the other DXers will figure out they can call early. Soon everyone is calling early. Earlier and earlier. And this is great for the first few callers who get through, but then the pilot deteriorates into chaos. Sometimes the DX operator gets disgusted and goes QRT. You'll hear this kind of tail ending. I personally don't recommend it. I don't recommend it. Now, here's the Here's an example of type one tail ending. That picture is a rock crusher. And that represents John KY, K, K6YT's transmitter on my frequency. Well, I, I'm using my 100 watt peanut whistle and a dipole and John has his kilowatt and stepper beam antenna. He's loud and right on top of my call sign. So for all you guys in the room here, you guys and gals, you can, you can hear John crushing me. Okay. <laughs> that works as long as he already had your call. Yeah, well, see, he, no, and, and it's, and it was okay for me because I was just finishing the QSO. I was sending 73, you know, thank you, 73. QSL oh, is DX station already had your call, correct? He already had my call. Yeah. yeah. So I was sending thanks QSL 73. So I wasn't losing the QSO, but he was getting ahead of everyone else. And that's fine until everyone else is doing it. <laughs> and then the DX gets disgusted. Okay. Now here's what I what I tend to use. Uh, I call it type two tail ending. Finish your call last after the DX uh, calls QRZ. So the DX has just completed his previous contact. They're ready for the onslaught of the wolf pack indicated by sending QRZ question mark. You delay your call and finish your call last. Now there's also a risk with this kind of tail ending. Um, you may be tail ending, well, the DX has already started to answer someone else. And then as you stop sending, you won't know who they answered or what's going on. So you, you may miss out that way. Type two tail ending works best in a split or fixed operation. It doesn't work very well in, in a split uh, moving operation. Okay, so let's see where we go. Here's my example. Okay, so here's, Ron, W6VG, silent key, rest in peace. But I got to use his short call sign to show how I tail ended him. I'm intentionally sending my prefix right after Ron's, right after Ron's prefix. So I'm basically QRMing his suffix. So the DX operator can't pick out his call sign. He'll usually answer the last clear call segment copied. In this case, it'll be SJ. So hopefully I'll hear SJ question mark, an invitation for me to repeat my call. So here's how it sounds. Okay. That's almost me. It's mean, but it's, you know, all's fair in the right? Now, here's here's what I call uh, serendipity uh, tail ending. Uh, Carolyn Gavin, WB6ABC, would never intentionally QRM anything. She started calling at the same time as everyone else. So this is what it sounded like. DX operator heard was BC. So the DX operator sent BC question mark. That's all he could copy and Carolyn gets in the log. 
Okay. Um, let's see. Where am I now? Just oh, I want my next slide. No, I don't. No. Sorry, I didn't want to do that. How do I? Okay. Yeah, I want to get, I just want to get to my next slide. Okay. Now, another part of timing isn't really a technique, but it's just a matter of being fully aware of what's going on in the pilot. You know, usually a pilot develops a rhythm, one one cue so after another, bang, bang, bang. There are always, but there'll always be an interruption to that rhythm. And I and I am always looking for that hiccup. It could come from QRM. There could be some bozo tuning up on the DX frequency, not even aware there's an expedition going on. It could be a caller who's got his his transmitter offset up two kilohertz like he should, but he hit the wrong VFO. So he's transmitting on the DX frequency. Or it could be the self-appointed frequency police or cops trying to supposedly help the situation, but they just create more QRM and confusion right on the DX's frequency. The confusion builds up. Other callers start standing by to listen. What's going on? What is all this? You know, it's just a mishmash. And there can frequently be a little sprint moment where you can hear a pin drop. That's when you drop in your call. Everyone is standing by like, what's going on? Don't stand by, drop your call in right then. Uh, another timing technique is when there's a QRX, uh, the DX might say QRX, they got to do something. But they might make one more contact. So try a quick call. Don't just, don't just sit back or go get a cup of coffee. And then there can be the long QRX where the DX disappears for maybe 10, 20 minutes. They have to fix an antenna, fuel a generator, restake the tent that's blowing over in the wind. The pack starts to lose interest and they drift away. They go get a cup of coffee, but be ready. When the DX returns, there may be fewer other callers and that's when you can make your contact. Many will keep calling even during this. Oh yeah, they'll call for the whole 20 minutes. <laughs> Uh, so that's my presentation. You need to listen more than you transmit. UCW's unique properties to enhance your DXing success. I hope I've convinced you to try CW, and I hope I've given you some pointers to optimize your CW capabilities. So are there any questions? This, this uh, PowerPoint will be posted on the NCDXC website. Yeah, go ahead. I'd like to add something about you know, working pileups and the ex the ex and such. And I've noticed a trend lately where obviously the, the expedition is using a computer. The computer is doing all the work as far as send them. So they send my call at 50 words a minute. Oh, yeah. And yeah, you know, there's bits at 50 words a minute, bits at 20 words, it just feeds all over the place. Yeah. And what that creates is a lot of people ask for repeats. Yeah. Slow down, yeah. Yeah. 25 words a minute, steady and smooth, you'll work more station. Yeah. Guaranteed. Paul, any comment? I'd like to get that message uh, to the next <laughs> This conversation with the expeditioners, a lot of them yeah. come from Eastern Europe. And they have a lot of pride in how they do CW. They've, they've really mastered their sending. And Dima. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, Dima won't slow down for anybody. Yeah. And, you know, he wants to go fast. He's, he's got incredible skills, but so do a lot of other e expeditioners. A lot of guys think they're working Dima and they're not. They're working someone else. But um, they have a lot of pride and, and they feel like, kind of like they're offering a crush to people if they slow down. So they're like, you know, like I can just wait and work someone else. I'm going to go fast. I, I think what, what Pete's talking can. about that I've heard, I've heard that. All this work is many you, 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 you should listen to uh, 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 the uh, 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 I've done it. That's the goal. These I've guys do 300 QSOs an hour. But they co they copy your, your call, they type it into the computer, and then the computer rips it out at 50 words a minute. Yeah. Yeah. And the receiving station doesn't care. 
So they well, or doesn't be, understand it. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I, I mean, I myself, it, it I struggle. Stabilizes the pilot. You know, with, when they're doing forty words a minute, I'm, <laughs> I'm struggling. You know, like yeah. does that mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but I mean, I've had this conversation true. as a leader, saying, "Hey, you know," um, and they're like, "Look, I'm doing three hundred cues an hour. My cues are accurate. Um, if they want to work someone slow, that they can just wait till someone slows on the radio." I'm going fast. I'm a race car driver. That's what I do. That's I know. I, you need to be talking to George. That's the It's a shame time. He's calling. He's He's coming too. He's coming too. Well, is already on the second model of objects. You know, the Bay guys, you know, the Bay guys, you know, their their signals were puny. My God, they were so weak and they were going 40 words a minute. Yeah. And it just added to the difficulty. Yeah. It yeah. Right now. Uh, it, it required, like for me, it required all my concentration, you know, just to, yeah. you know, really, it was tough. It was tough going. Um, but those guys have a lot of pride, and a lot of them just, they just won't sit down. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much, Steve. That was excellent. A lot of good material. I'll be looking at that video, I think, a couple of times. <laughs>